afternoon, good evening to our webinar about the US ESCO market, Trends and Barriers, presented by Timothy Unruh and Donald Gilligan from uh, NAESCO. Before we move forward with our webinar, a brief presentation um, of the Global ESCO Network, uh, your host today. Um, The Global ESCO Network, um, of which I am uh, in all modesty the chairman, uh, was established back in 2020, or we started preparing the establishment in 2019. Um, it is a network of uh, networks in the sense that we are organizing ESCO associations around the world. We now have 34 partners. Uh, as far as we know, there are only 38 or 39 ESCO associations uh, on the planet. So we are we are achieving our aim to become a global network. On the map here, you can see where we are. The green countries are those where we are present or where we have partners, partner associations. The blue are those that we're still missing. And the gray or white, or whatever color you would call it, uh, are those countries where we at least so far have not identified uh, an ESCO association. Global ESCO Network fills at least three gaps. We were established uh, after observing that ESCOs are generally not present on a global climate change agenda, where we feel they have a significant role to play, particularly as countries generally are including energy efficiency uh, in, in their nationally determined contributions. But they do not include any instruments on how to achieve the efficiency targets that they're setting themselves. We also observed that there was no forum for ESCO associations exchange of experience. Uh, there was no dialogue uh, platform for ESCO associations, and we felt there was a demand. Uh, and finally, there was no repository for, for literature uh, on ESCO, so everybody was left to themselves to figure out what exactly are the trends uh, and barriers for, for ESCOs. We work uh, for but the network works for the integrated uh, use of the ESCO industry uh, as an implementation partner uh, for countries that want to use energy efficiency as a significant part of their nationally determined contributions. As I mentioned, we have um, in the middle here, you can see our publications database. You can visit our website, uh, the globalesconetwork.org, uh, to find our, our library. Uh, where we also have a couple of publications that we have already published, one of which is uh, focused on regulatory barriers, a publication that we intend to publish once a year with updated barriers as we identify them. We also run a program of webinars of which today's webinar is one. Uh, we aim to have a monthly webinar. The next one would be on the Chinese market next month. Um, and we participate, of course, uh, now increasingly also in conferences around the world where we are now gathering again uh, after the corona uh, pandemic. We know that energy efficiency doesn't happen sufficiently quickly by itself uh, and needs regulation uh, or regulatory intervention, as uh, we are suggesting uh, in order to maximize energy efficiency uh, as uh, and emissions reduction achieved through uh, ESCO involvement. Uh, we find that energy, achieve, energy efficiency achieved through ESCOs is one of the cheapest emissions reduction options, but we also find that countries oftentimes get it wrong when they try to regulate, regulate on energy efficiency and particularly regulate um, sometimes against uh, even ESCO involvement. We promote an ESCO ecosystem that consists of a number of elements, and I'm not going to go through the elements here. I'm sure that Tim and, and Donald are going to and some of them, uh, we have a list here of eight different um, elements that we would like to see uh, promoted in uh, markets and countries that, that wish to uh, further ESCO involvement. We're guided by an advisory board of seven, of which uh, Tim is also a member. Um, and uh, we hope, of course, that, that we, with the help of our advisory board, can, can further detail um, the policy advice that we are going to provide. That's all from me. Uh, visit us at our website uh, or send us a mail if you want to get in contact. 
I would now like to hand over the microphone to to Timothy Unruh first, uh, after which uh, Donald uh, Gilligan would take over the presentation. Thank you very much. Well, it's great to be here, Soren, and thank you for uh, uh, doing a great introduction about the Global ESCO Network. I know uh, you've worked really hard to get that established, and uh, it's been great working with you. Uh, I know I know um, I have a lot of members in the United States who have a lot of different uh, uh, worldwide offices that they do ESCO work in. So it's been great to get to know them, and it's been great working with you as we try to get the ESCO market growing across the entire uh, globe. Uh, Donald, won't you share your slide, and we'll go ahead and start on our presentation. So we're going to talk today about the United States market for ESCO growth. Um, it's uh, it's something that's been around for quite some time, and the ESCO market in the United States is actually a rather complicated one, uh, a lot of times compared to other regions, in that we have so many different markets where the ESCOs are active. So first of all, we're going to talk about just who our organization is, and then I'm going to turn it over to Don, and he's going to give us some talk about the uh, growth of our industry, how it kind of got started, how it's growing, and where it's going. Uh, the major market drivers, including the new federal funding, um, if you've been paying attention to the U.S. market, we have had uh, significant amounts of government funding come into efforts to uh, re do infrastructure improvement, climate repairs, uh, remedy from COVID. We've had so many things happen. There's a lot of money still available in the U.S. market to fund ESCO projects. New technologies have an interesting role. Sometimes people think that it's new technologies that drive the ESCO market. We'll talk about that. And there's some drive there, but there's other factors as well that have a significant piece. And then potential new markets for ESCO is where we might be seeing us having growth. And then I'll take, pick up and uh, close the webinar and talk about the risk management's key to growth, because risk management is actually what we think is one of the most important things of an ESCO project. So a little bit about the National Association of Energy Service Companies, NAESCO. Um, we are a group of energy service companies that have come together. We have, uh, it, it says 44 ESCOs uh, on our list, but we actually had a new one come in about a week ago. So we have 45 ESCOs now and we have 135 members and we have been growing quite significantly. Those members that are not ESCOs are affiliate members and affiliate members to us are those companies that supply goods and or services to energy service companies and they work side by side with us. The, the National Association was founded in 1983 and we were reminded that that means next year we'll be 40 years old. Uh, so we're, we're growing and have been around for quite some time. Um, the, the market in the U.S., we estimate is around $7 billion annually, and that is um, the total delivered revenue, total delivered and revenue of the projects that we uh, put out across all the markets in the United States. In the U.S., ESCOs have delivered a significant amount of project benefits. I won't read all of those there. You can look at those and see, we often measure our benefits in how much project we can install. So when we think about signing a contract, we think about how much um, how much um, capital installation that contract drives. And and so when we when we when we look at the size of that, that's really where we measure our market size and our impact. Uh, typical ESCO projects in the United States can range anywhere from you know small ones are about two million U.S. dollars. Large ones can be hundreds of millions of U.S. dollars. And then we also like to look at the person years of direct employment. Uh, jobs are a big deal in the United States, and so we always try to measure what's the impact of our market and what do we do for jobs. The projects that we install, and Donald's going to talk more about this, but we do energy efficiency, renewable energy, sustainability technologies, focuses that we see today happening in our resilience is a big issue. Cybersecurity is a big issue. Um, and along with that, the specific technologies of microgrids have been, been growing. Uh, so we really see uh, quite an opportunity to uh, not just come in and install hardware, but to come in and be an overall uh, project delivery and problem solving industry. Uh, when we do our work in the United States, uh, right now, the bulk of our projects are called energy savings performance contracts. And there are specifically defined contract where the savings is used to pay off the financing of the project and the terms of our projects will go anywhere from 10 to 25 years. So Donald, next slide, you can take it from here. So good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first thing that I'm gonna talk about is the phases of the US ESCO growth over the last, um, as Tim said, almost 40 years. So we do uh, periodic surveys of the industry 
with one of our national laboratories, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And this is a chart of the uh, growth of the industry since 1990. So about 30 year, 30 plus years on this chart. The dark blue lines are what we actually surveyed, what was reported by the ESCOs as actual revenues. And then the um, lighter blue lines are the estimates that the ESCOs give us when they give us their actual revenue data that then estimate what their performance is going to be for the next few years. As you can see, they tend to uh, overestimate growth, but the growth has been pretty steady over the, over the course of this uh, graph. ESCO industry started in the mid 1980s. Uh, utilities were mandated by their regulators to solicit bids for what they called energy efficiency power plants. The utilities paid for kilowatt hours delivered, uh, typically 80 to 100 percent of the project cost. The savings were uh, monitored with utility level metering, which took about 15% of the project cost. <clears throat> the ESCOs grew up assembling turnkey service packages, audits, construction, financing, maintenance, plus savings guarantees. Measures were mostly lighting and controls. And so the ESCOs targeted customers with very high run hours, industrial customers, hospitals, prisons, some schools. Um, the projects were uh, financed by the ESCOs using what we call shared savings contract contracts in which the ESCO assumes both the project performance risk and the credit risk uh, of, of the customer. Our second stage of evolution was in the mid 1990s to the early 2000s. The customers became more comfortable with energy efficiency technologies. I was in the ESCO business at that point, and we went very quickly from a situation where ESCOs had to stock electronic ballasts and uh, uh, T8 bulbs because we couldn't get the normal electric distribution channels to stock that. So we went from a few, a few years where ESCOs had their offices filled with, elect, with this equipment to a situation where the, uh, the big box stores were, were stocking the stuff. The federal, we, we got laws passed at both the federal level and the state level to authorize performance contracting. Um, and a lot of those laws were driven off the fact that the Government agencies were mandating energy savings, but not appropriating capital to actually make those savings. The projects became larger, more complex. The utilities about ninth, around the turn of the uh, millennium, the utilities began to buy out ESCOs. So for a few years, there were probably 50 utility owned ESCOs. Um, we also introduced a new financing model. So what we call guaranteed savings replaces shared savings. In a guaranteed savings prod, product project, there are two different contracts that the customer signs. There's one contract with the ESCO to install a certain set of measures, and those measures have guaranteed savings. Then there's a second contract that the ESCO that the customer signs with a bank or a specialized financing company to provide the financing and uh, the customer pays the uh, financing company and the ESCO is responsible for delivering the savings. We also had a new m and model that was developed jointly by NASCO, uh, the US, um, uh, Engineering Society, ASHRAE, the U.S. Department of Energy, and a few other organizations that jointly developed what we now call the IPMVP, International uh, 
performance measurement verification protocol that's now, as you know, run by an organization called EVO, Efficiency Valuation Organization, IPMVP, is in its fourth generation of, of systems. That really revolutionized the market in the US because there were now independent standards with that a finance company could use to verify savings. Uh, prior to that, savings were calculated on individual engineers' spreadsheets, and they were pretty impenetrable to anybody but the engineer who, who actually made the spreadsheet. So here's a graphic, again, from one of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab reports, which show how over time, the projects in each of the market segments are becoming more comprehensive. So this is, we have six different market segments that we track, federal government, healthcare, K-12 schools, uh, private organizations, state and local government, and uh, universities and colleges. We started out, as I, as I said before, with only a couple of measures lighting, uh, maybe some, some of the first generation of HVAC controls, and we're now built up to the, the uh, situation where a typical project has seven to eight distinct measures. And also, given the increase in the number of measures, the investment in the projects has also grown significantly. So. You can see in the different market segments how the investment has grown, and uh, that continues to grow uh, past the uh, the threshold of of the last survey that we did. The next step in evolution of the U.S. market was the real focus on public facilities. And that started shortly after the turn of the millennium and continues today. The drivers of that switch were industrial and large commercial customers were turned off by the Enron uh, crisis, the debacle in the U.S. and, uh, and the financial crisis. So those customers are even today are unwilling to make the kind of long-term deals, long-term contracts that ESCO sell. I mean, the, what I say when asked why we don't have a lot of industrial and large commercial customers, it's because we're selling what those customers don't want to buy. We're selling long-term comprehensive projects. Uh, the uh, Industrial and commercial customers typically want short payback, maybe single or two or three technology projects. Um, so we shifted our focus to public buildings. Those are largely driven by energy savings mandates at the federal and state level. I'll talk about that a little more. And the, the basic offer that we're making to these public customers is we're repurposing money that you're currently wasting to finance capital improvements that you really need in these buildings. What we found is that deferred maintenance, which is really rampant in public buildings in the US, plus the lack of investment capital, translates into very large projects. As Tim said, the threshold, the lower end threshold for US projects is typically about $2 million, and it can go up into the hundreds of millions of dollars for large federal facilities. Paybacks are typically 10 to 20 years, and ESCOs are constantly adding new technologies to meet customer needs. So distributed generation, renewables, storage, street lighting, water, uh, utility subsidies, utility incentives, help project economics, but they're typically not the primary driver. This graphic shows um, the revenue trends by market segment. 
So you can see over time that the uh, unit, the K to 12 schools segment has grown significantly, as well as the university and college segment. So together, those constitute almost half of the of the U.S. market. You add in the state and local government facilities, city halls, police stations, state office buildings, things like that, and you're up close to three quarters of the market. And you can see that at the very top of the of these um, columns in orange is the commercial and industrial, private commercial and industrial segment, which is very small as a share of our market. So what are the major market drivers? Pretty simple. Government mandates, public facility needs, and new funding. The new funding is uh, just in the last 18 months. So federal and state legislation requires significant energy use reductions in government facilities. Um, new uh, greenhouse gas reduction mandates just in the last two years for all federal facilities, specify the use of performance contracting. Surveys indicate that U.S. public facilities won't need more than $1 trillion of capital investment. This is not to bring these buildings up to the standards of the most modern building that you might build today. In most cases, this capital investment is required to bring these buildings up to current building code. So it's, it's very difficult to overstate the need of capital investment in US public facilities. Fortunately, the Biden administration has tried to begin to address this problem with substantial funding for public infrastructure. There were three COVID stimulus bills, we call stimulus bills in the 2020 and 2021. Then there was the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act in 2021 and the Inflation Reduction Act in 2022. The Inflation Reduction Act is the largest single investment in US history in uh, energy efficiency and um, greenhouse gas reduction. This potential investment is billions of dollars, but there are many new programs in these in these legislation that must be administered by significantly understaffed federal granting agencies. One of the things that happened in the Trump administration is that the staffing levels in the Department of Energy and the Environmental Protection Administration, which are the two agencies that are handling most of this money, were dramatically reduced. And we're currently trying to catch up with those staffing levels at the same time that there's this flood of new money coming in and new programs. At the state level, uh, we have states that are driving the escrow market not through a lot of uh, capital investment, but through administrative actions. So the states are producing standardized uh, project documentation processes, uh, and they are mandating, increasingly mandating that state agencies implement all cost-effective uh, performance contracts. And one of the things that we have seen over the last few years is that a lot of the ESCO projects are not driven by the need to save energy. What we find is that a, 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 an administrator in a public school district, for example, doesn't wake up in the morning and thinking, boy, I, I, I really want to do something to save the planet today. That administrator wakes up and says, my boiler is not going to make it through the next winter. 
I don't have any money in my budget to replace the boiler. What am I going to do? That is what drives a lot of the uh, ESCO projects in the U.S. today. So this graphic shows in, um, in the different market segments what percentage of the uh, revenues ESCOs are reporting are actually driven by um, the need for capital improvements as opposed to the, the uh, desire to save energy or reduce greenhouse gases. And you can see that there's very few ESCOs that are reporting in the light blue color that none of their projects are being driven by the need for capital investments. And uh, this is a, a little bit complicated graphic, but it shows how the what we call the simple payback time in projects is increased significantly as the um, new technologies are brought on and as the uh, public sector customers are trying to address their uh, capital investment needs. Next section is uh, the role of new technologies. And we think that uh, it's not a particular technology that is really driving long-term growth, but the ability of ESCOs to adapt to a, a continuing uh, influx of new technologies into the marketplace. So I'll just talk briefly about three different technology areas, lighting, HVAC and controls, and uh, solar photovoltaics. So lighting, really drove the first phase of growth of the ESCO market. The technology was pretty simple. It was easy to demonstrate the, uh, the savings. Uh, I remember doing a, an audit in a, uh, a high-tech factory outside of Boston. This must have been in the early 90s. And we were pitching the, uh, the factory manager very hard. And he finally said, listen, this is total bullshit. Pardon my French. Um, he said, I'm a trained physicist. You can't tell me that you're going to reduce the lighting levels, the, the electricity used for lighting in my factory by 50%, and the quality of the lighting is going to improve. So we you know, showed him a number of spreadsheets and all of that, and we finally said, wait a second. What we'll do is we'll come into your office. We'll install the new lighting system in your office. We'll measure wattage before, wattage, wattage, wattage after, and we'll come back in 30 days. And if you don't like the system, we'll take it out and you'll never hear from us again. Well, of course, the system delivered exactly what we said it was going to deliver. That was a fairly simple system. But because it was a simple system, the market caught up very quickly so that ESCOs lost their advantage in the market. When we first started, ESCOs were the only ones who really knew about electronic ballasts and T8 lighting. Um, pretty quickly, the, uh, special, the lighting firms that are lighting maintenance companies in the US and, and electrical contractors, they were e easily a able to install this new technology. It was readily available through distributors. So what the ESCOs learned to do is to partner with those lighting firms, not try to compete with them, but partner with them to shift uh, the risk. So that the risk was shared between the lighting firms and the ESCO, which enabled us to continue the growth. In HVAC and controls, when we started, the, lar the larger companies sold proprietary control systems, and um, they were able to finance and manage the retrofits that specifically apply to those things that they that they sold their products. Again, the market caught up. The proprietary control systems 
were replaced by generic hardware and open source. Sir. And mechanical contractors have learned how to manage project development and even the guarantees. So when we first started, mechanical contractors were not interested in getting into the ESCO business because the development time for projects was very long. They're used to responding to 30 or 60 day bid solicitations. These are you know, one year project development cycles and they were afraid of the guarantees. Well, they gradually learned how to manage the project development costs and they learned that the guarantees weren't so scary. So today, about a third of the ESCO members of NASCO are actually divisions of mechanical contractors. That wasn't true 10, 15 years ago. So again, what the ESCO has learned is how to partner with the mechanical contractors to grow the business. In solar uh, photovoltaics, we started out bundling um, PV into a comprehensive project when when uh, PV was first introduced in the mass market, which enabled us to blend the long payback photovoltaic installations with short payback lighting and controls. The market caught up. Number one, the Chinese manufacturers were able to reduce the price of the photovoltaic systems quite dramatically. We had tax incentives in the U.S. that um, really diluted the, ben the benefit of comprehensive projects. So you no longer needed to have a, light, a quick payback lighting project to offset the long payback cost of the photovoltaic system because the photovoltaic systems were cheap enough that they could stand on their own. And the ESCOs found that they couldn't compete with the low overhead, uh, just PV vendors. They're companies that just did one technology. So again, ESCO has learned to partner with the vendors and to integrate photovoltaics with some of the new technologies, storage, demand response, or what we're calling uh, grid interactive buildings, microgrids, other kinds of, of uh, systems that a standalone PV contractor really can't do. They don't have any expertise in those areas. You know, they're very good about installing the uh, panels on a roof and connecting to the electric system, but all of the rest of, of the technologies which we need today are beyond them. Um, <clears throat> here is a, a graphic of the, the shift in technologies to more capital intensive retrofit. So you see at the beginning of the market in the first period in the early 1990s, the uh, red uh, in the columns is the lighting only projects. Then we shift to major HVAC. And in the, um, the last phase, on-site generation, which in our world includes renewables, is a growing, significantly growing percentage of the business. And again, bear in mind that this survey data is a few years old and the uh, on-site generation component has grown significantly. The final section that I'll deal with is, is new markets. So what are, we, what are we looking at in the ESCO business to continue to grow the business? First thing is design, build, what we call design, build, construction projects. So and this is a project in a uh, public facility where a single company both designs the project and builds the project. It's an alternative to the way that public facility construction has been done for 100 years uh, in which an independent architect or architect and engineering firm designs a specification and puts that specification out to bid. Uh, we think that uh, performance contracting is just a one form of the design build um, 
system. So design and build is the generic system. Performance contracting is the uh, application of design build to energy and energy related uh, construction. What we find is that some states permit some non-energy measures to be included in a performance contract, but it's usually limited to a small percentage of contract value, maybe 10% or 15%, and it's ancillary to the energy measures. So for example, the construction of an outbuilding to house a new backup generating system or a uh, um, <clears throat> in a water treatment facility uh, building some new uh, buildings or new structure within the water treatment facility to house the new equipment uh, that, that is designed to save energy. What we're finding in the, in the U.S. is that ESCOs want to significantly expand the measures which are allowed in these contracts. So water and wastewater facilities are, are probably the biggest example. Um, the other example is the construction of a zero net energy school or either a new school or a, a new wing on a school. One of our newer ESCO members uh, has made a business in the Midwest, in the U.S., of building zero net energy schools. When they started, everybody thought they were crazy. They built a bunch of the schools. The schools are performing very well. And uh, so ESCOs want to expand that business. Unfortunately, we find very strong resistance from other uh, players in the construction industry, architects and engineers, general contractors, specialized construction companies. You know, throughout the U.S., there are companies that specialize in just doing water and wastewater treatment uh, facilities. They don't like the ESCOs uh, edging into that business at all. So we've, we've had to fight some uh, legislative fights in different states to try to uh, <clears throat> uh, push back uh, these other industry players in the business, which means that the business has become much more political than it was a decade ago. Um, and this is a graphic that shows the um, percentage of non-energy savings in the different market segments. Uh, you can see in the um, some of our biggest markets, the K-12 schools and the state and local government, uh, non-energy savings are, are, are a significant portion of the total savings in a project. In the K-12 schools, it's 30 plus percent. In the <clears throat> state and local government, it's approaching uh, 25 percent. Uh, those are indications of the the need for capital investment in these facilities that is paired with the uh, energy saving measures that oftentimes are the ones that are that are driving the project payback. And uh, now I'm going to turn it back to Tim to do the last uh, piece of this. Thanks, Don. You've done a great job uh, kind of giving us an overall picture of the U.S. market. Let's go to the next slide. Talk about risk management. Um, in our ESCO projects, uh, managing risk is really one of the, the things that gets a lot of time. Uh, and, and we think of risk in a lot of different ways. I'm going to talk about a few cases here, but there's the risk in construction. Uh, most of our projects are being built in buildings that are existing. And, and you know, one of the most challenging places to work is in an existing building. New construction, you know, building something from scratch, that's easy because you control all the variables. But when you come into an existing building, significant risk in the construction exists because once you begin to tear open a wall, you don't know what's behind that. Just because a drawing says that something's supposed to be there does not mean that's what happened. Uh, the other side of the risk is, is on the performance of the project. And uh, you, have, you have the issue of, of how will the project perform over potentially 20 years, two decades of performance. Uh, 
So let's talk about some of these risk pieces. So marketing and sales is, is the first one, is uh, recognizing that you're selling something that's a unique piece. You're not responding to a bid. You're not trying to come up and calculate your costs and send in a bid and hope that they like your numbers. You're really looking for a comprehensive, long payback project. And you're trying to understand what it is that your benefit is to the client and that you come in uh, with a project development mindset that you have to identify what it is you have to do before you can even start to do any talk about pricing or development. The market segments are important to recognize where you want to focus. Um, uh, we have we have some uh, members that focus on K through 12 schools. So those are elementary, junior high, high schools, uh, and so forth. And those schools have a particular way that they buy and they pick a methodology that they go to market. If you're working with the the K through tw uh, the uh, state and local market, there's a different process that they may go to market. And so you have to understand who it is that you're trying to sell to and develop your strategy associated with what market and what the process they go through. Uh, the, the second I'm down there under marketing sales is the long sales cycle. Uh, in various segments, there's a different duration. But uh, in the federal government, for example, the sales cycle has been documented on average that from the time that you, you receive notice that a project is imminent to when you sign a contract to build a project, it takes 24 months or two years. Um, I will tell you those long cycles and that long decision process is challenging in today's environment where we have prices that are continually escalating. So you may you may propose something to a client and they not make a decision for three months, but three months later, the prices you propose are no longer available. The contractors that you wanted to propose are already booked on other projects. And so you have to do some significant reworking that may shrink the size of the project. So timely decisions have become very critical for the industry. Um, the last bullet on that left column, the second best first sales call is a quick goodbye. That's an interesting aspect of our industry is it's important for us to recognize that we do a preliminary assessment of a site. And that preliminary assessment often is thought of as a technical product, that it's something that you're going to have engineers do and engineers develop. But the reality is, is, is a significant part of the preliminary analysis has to be done by the business development side. And that's to understand the client. So all the, all the technical piece says is, can we do a project here? Well, let's just say in most places, you probably can do a project. But, but you also have to understand, is the client particularly suited to do this project? Do they believe that they have the authority to do the project? Are they in the mindset to do the project? There are so many questions that a business development person has to ask. And so the real burden at the beginning of the sales cycle is on the business development person, not just to find the client and to help them move forward in the process, but to also qualify the client and make sure that the client really wants the project. Because you can go a lot of effort and spend a lot of time and engineering effort developing the project when the client was not ready and you may never close that project. The contract and construction is probably one of the most obvious places where you think of risk. And the way the ESCO market works is uh, ESCO's um, don't necessarily have all of the specialties in-house. So I think Donald mentioned wastewater treatment facilities and water treatment facilities have become a large ESCO market in the United States. ESCOs don't traditionally have a significant deep bench of experience and expertise in water treatment and wastewater treatment facilities. And so what they do is they go partner with another company that has that. In the same way they partnered with lighting companies, the same way they may partner with a solar installation company or a wind installation or a battery installation, perhaps even a microgrid if they're going to need that on a project. The, the ESCO is, is, is real expertise, is bringing together a team of experts and causing them to work in conjunction towards a common goal. So from the client standpoint, you may see these different entities, but the delivery to you is though it's coming from one entity. Uh, the other piece that's a, a big part of it is uh, that in-house or retained attorneys who specialize in ESBC to write contracts. It's not always writing the contracts. In the U.S., most markets have a fairly standardized contract structure. Uh, one of our partner associations called the Energy Services Coalition, along with the Department of Energy, have created some standard contract structures that, that are used fairly universal across the industry. But where the attorneys come in handy is that um, – reinterpretation of the statutes and the laws that allow 
energy savings performance contracts, and ESCO work to exist are always being challenged and changed, and thoughts are 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 migrating and and become different. And the attorneys help us to stay level and focused on this is allowed, this is how it's allowed, and this is what's not allowed. And then the last column, the savings and measurement and verification. As Donald mentioned, U.S. ESCOs use the IPMVP options A, B, and C. And I was really proud of Donald that he was able to get that acronym spelled out, the International Performance Measurement and Verification Protocol. And I'm only able to do that because I just heard Donald do it correctly because I always get the P's mixed up and mess up that acronym. So it's great to have Donald on the call to keep me straight there. But the IVMP, IPMVP has been a real useful tool, along with other structures of how the savings guarantee works, to make sure that our measurement and verification plans are consistent and that they're, they're understandable by the clients. One of the key things, the way we define our savings guarantee, is that we guarantee units of energy, not dollars. So if the rate were to change during the project delivery cycle of the performance period of 10 to 20 years, that rate change would have to be absorbed by the clients, not by the energy service company. Uh, we allow operation and maintenance savings, which is a growing portion of our projects. And this is savings that could come from parts and pieces that are being used to keep a component operating and running, or it could come from a contract where you have a third-party maintenance contract, and that is canceled with a new contract at a lower cost. Some of our energy service companies have operation and maintenance, O&M responsibilities, where they have to come in and provide operation of the equipment and maintenance. Sometimes it's just operation, sometimes it's just maintenance. Uh, most contracts, the owner takes control of operation maintenance, but there are some where operation and maintenance are required. Um, and, then, and then the building operating parameters is uh, key to understand uh, what is it that the building is supposed to be doing. Um, if you have a gymnasium, what are its normal operating hours? What do you normally have the temperature at? Uh, where do you run the lighting? And so forth. That establishes where you're starting the project savings from. And lastly, baseline adjustments. If you come into a case where there's been changes, how do you adjust the baseline so that you can account for that and that who takes risk for who takes the risk of that change? Um, key to us is making sure that the customer understands the M&V reports. Um, a lot of times it's real nice to just stick a report in an envelope, put it in the mail and they receive it and you check the box, you're done. But the key is, is that these are such long term contracts the annual measurement verification report becomes a tool to update the client on what's happening with the project, why did we do the project, so that as time passes, we don't start to develop thoughts that maybe this project wasn't worthwhile, why did we do this, why are we still paying for this now 10 years after we installed this. The annual measurement verification report provides the opportunity for that. And then lastly, we, we will store all projects electronically uh, to assure access for the term of the contract. The challenge comes in is that as government officials change roles, we find that during the duration of our contract, we'll have multiple players come in that don't know about the project, have access to the files. And so it's important for the ESCO to know where the files are at, keep those files for a long period of time, because it can be 20 years project. We have federal projects that go to 25 years. So that becomes a real key piece of the risk mitigation. Well, well, with that, um, Don, why don't you go to the next slide? This concludes our presentation, and so I'd like to see if we have any questions today. Soren, do you have any questions out there for us? Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Donald. Yes, yes, we, we do have questions um, from the audience. And the first question is uh, for Don, uh, which is, concerns the, the commercial and industrial customers that uh, do not want to buy long-term solutions from ESCOs, but prefer short payback uh, measures. The question is here, hypothetically, if uh, project equity was invested by a third-party investor, like an ESCO, um, uh, so in, in project assets outside uh, of the balance sheet of uh, the, the commercial or industrial customer, um, would the U.S. ESCOs increase their business with uh, the industrial customers? Uh, that's, I think, not clear. Um, the problem is not the, the financing terms, but the problem is that the, that the customers do not want to enter into a long-term agreement. The, um, 
in the U.S., industrial facilities tend to be either very small shops that operate on the margins of the uh, of of an of a, of a particular process, um, or they are units of big industrial companies that are not only competing with other companies around the world, but are competing internally for survival within the company. And none of, none of that motivates people to enter into long-term agreements. I mean, we do have a new form of financing in the U.S. called an energy savings agreement in which the customer pays only for delivered savings. But the terms of those agreements are typically seven plus years. What ESCOs find when they talk to, to uh, potential industrial customers is that the customer says, well, I don't know if I'm going to be here in seven years and I can't sign a, that kind of contract. And, and Donald, just to add to that, it's, it's not even the don't know if I'll be here in seven years. You know, we all go down the street and we see these factories that have been there, these industrial sites that have been there for decades. And you say, how can they say I won't be there? The issue comes in is that they get a contract to build a widget, I say, you know, something. And what they don't know is that contract is a two-year contract. And while that, that widget can be built for two years and is profitable, the next contract might be to build something that's of a different configuration that requires a different component set and layout of their factory. And so the challenge is that they enter into a seven-year contract for savings off of certain equipment operation. And then the next contract doesn't need that equipment, then they have a problem. And so that becomes a real issue at industrial sites is that short term mentality doesn't mix with a long term investment strategy, which is needed for energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Uh, another question uh, also for Donald, but I think but you're, you're, of course, both free to to uh, to answer. Um, are there some examples of non-energy capital uh, retrofit strategies? Um, well, if you start with the premise that a lot of let's start with just public schools. So the school the school is really desperate for capital investment. We have a large number of schools in the U.S. where part of the facilities are are what we call temporary classrooms, which means a trailer, basically. A specialized trailer has a short-term uh, life expectancy if you, you know, you put dozens of kids in that trailer every day, they beat the living <laughs> tar out of it. So what happens when the, um, the school district says, well, we either got to buy new trailers or we got to try and build a building. And what ESCOs are beginning to say is, well, we can offer you a building or an addition to your building that really minimizes energy use. And we'd like to be in that business. And in certain states, that is allowed. In other states, it's not allowed at all. Right. Thanks. Um, as a been any recorded observed ESCO market contraction in the U.S. through the pandemic? If so, is the market back to pre-pandemic growth levels? Tim, well, I, I, I'll try that one out. Um, you know, so so when the pandemic first came, um, there was a whole lot of, as I'm sure it was experienced worldwide, there was a whole lot of shutdown mentality. Uh, everyone was scared and didn't know what was happening. But pretty quickly, um, I think schools and buildings figured out that while no one was in the buildings, it might be a real good time to get that project done. So uh, at least from what I report, while I would not say that the business was was 100% of its existing, during the pandemic, uh, ESCOs pretty quickly rebounded and were busy. Uh, not just with the projects they might have had, but I heard ESCOs talk about doing other configuration projects. Some larger uh, companies were doing work with hospitals, and cities to reconfigure spaces to handle uh, you know, for COVID wards and so forth. But uh, today what I'm hearing is, is that th there's a lot of work happening. The biggest challenge that uh, the ESCOs are having now in fulfilling that work is availability of materials, 
prices of materials and availability of personnel to install the materials. <clears throat> so our, our challenge that we see in the United States is that I think the market is there and that uh, ESCOs are thriving in that market. And I don't have numbers to support this. I just have anecdotal evidence. But, but it does appear that the market has returned. The challenge is in the fulfillment side with the availability of materials. I think I mentioned earlier that the price challenges were really uh, significant. Uh, once you make a final proposal to a client, uh, many times that client wants to have a lot of reviews by attorneys and other people. If you spend a month reviewing something, you not only might lose the part, you will lose the price. So uh, your challenge becomes uh, timeliness now in making project approvals. But I do believe that the market has returned pretty significantly to its former state. You know, in, in the U.S., we have several segments of our market. And so when I talk about the market, I think I, I'm really referring to the state and local market, which is states, cities, counties. Uh, and then I'm talking about the K through 12 market. That's uh, elementary, middle school and high school. The, those two markets are roughly 50% of the work in the United States. Another 20% is the federal market. 20, 22% is the federal market in the United States. Our federal market has had some challenges recently. Uh, for the past three or four years, we've had a, a lull in the amount of work that's been put out. Um, and again, this is agency specific. We do see some agencies coming back and putting out more work. But the federal market might still be down from what it was before. And that is probably more driven by political aspirations than pandemic problems. Thanks. Maybe I could follow up on that just, just now that uh, we have a, a significant price hike uh, on, on energy, uh, which normally is considered to be a driver for, for energy efficiency. And I, I just wonder, does that also now influence the ESCO business? Well, you know, the, the price hike you talk about is probably related to natural gas in Europe and electricity being natural gas produced in Europe. In the United States, I don't know that electricity prices were seeing um, what I'll call a significant aberration in price right now. Um, we're, we're really seeing it fairly, you know, fairly flat. But, but Donald's raised his hand, so I'm going to refer to Donald, who might have some more recent information. I think, I think the effect on natural gas prices and the effect on electricity prices is very regional. So yeah. I live in the northeast United States outside of Boston. Our local utilities have announced uh, 50 to 60 percent price increases in, the, in electricity for the coming uh, for the winter season. And uh, uh, the natural gas utilities have not announced price increases, but we would expect those price increases to be, uh, you know, 30 to 40 percent oil, which is widely used to heat in the non-urban areas in the Northeast. Again, 50% increases. Those are not so dependent on the world market as they are on constraints in the natural gas pipeline system and constraints in the uh, oil uh, supply system, which is still, you know, it's like a 1950s system barges and trucks and you know when the barges can't get up the Hudson River because it's frozen we have a crisis <laughs> so yeah and you compare that Donald so the prices are very regional um, throughout the Midwest center part of our country electric prices are very low and yeah. uh, we we see them staying low I was just telling Donald uh, this morning the place I'm at now in Texas uh, the gas price down the street is two ninety nine a gallon which is about 75 cents a liter. So that's a fairly low price, uh, even in the United States for, for, for gasoline. Uh, other fuels follow a similar type pattern depending upon where you're at in the country. So they're not so much driven by the world crisis, but more by local regional issues. Thanks. I think we're coming to an end, but we still have an, uh, a few questions. Uh, I would take one, one last I'm question. I'm gonna have to drop off because I have another meeting scheduled at this point. So I I can leave you with him and he can answer all the questions, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, much, Tom. For Thank, you very much. Thank you. Sorry. Bye bye. Take care, Don. Yeah. Tim, just one last question that we are we're going to um, 
to close our session. Um, are as uh, as a service models applied by the ESCO industry in the US? Do you see any potential for these and other new business models? And if so, in which sectors? So I think the as a service model has a lot of potential in the US. And we see a lot of our member companies telling us that they're doing something related to as a service. So let's just establish the primary difference between the traditional ESCO energy sales performance contract and an ESCO as a service model, the primary difference is the ownership of the equipment. Now, I mean, there's other subtle differences, but that becomes kind of the big differentiator. In an ESCO model with an energy sales performance contract, the ESCO procures the equipment, installs it, and the equipment is now owned and often operated by the client or the owner. In an as a service model, the equipment remains the property of the ESCO or the financier or the, the you know, multi-purpose entity that was established. And uh, often operation and maintenance is controlled by that company as well. And so in some ways, the difference is, is as opposed to you're selling savings on the energy sales performance contract side, in a sense, you're selling a product delivery at a lower price. And so it's saving still, but it's it's done in a different invoice format. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential for that. Um, I know there is some interest in that from the private sector market, which has not been active in the energy savings performance contract area in a significant way. Um, it, it could pose challenging in some government projects because of the way the ownership is done and they may or may not find it legal. But yes, we do see that market growing. We see a lot of opportunity in that. My members are discussing it and my members are engaged in it. Thanks a lot, Tim. And that concludes our session for today. Um, it's been a pleasure to having you all on board. We've had a record number of participants uh, for your information. Uh, we hope we can we can repeat the success again in a month's time where we're having the, the Chinese market uh, under scrutiny. Um, so thanks for now. Um, and... Uh, looking forward to seeing you again. Take right. care.